Hey everyone, I've gotten a lot of requests to do an episode on the Masso and how I set it all up, so I'm going to do that today. First thing I'm going to do is turn on the power to the whole system by using this power bar that was obviously meant for Christmas trees. You can hear all the motors starting up when that huge 80 volt power supply turns on. I call this power supply the shield generator because it kind of looks like one. So. I got my e-stop all rigged up here to a uh, computer on switch, so I just uh, cycle that. E-stop turns off and it should be ready to move. Um, it's not going to let me do anything though until I type in the password, which is cute but very annoying after a while. So the password is HTG to start out, so hit enter. Now I should be ready to move. Uh, the first thing it's going to want me to do after the password is home, so I hit control alt home. I was just going to do that. Beautiful. Now it's ready to run. Um, so I'll bring you in closer and you can see what kind of setup I've got. Um, I'm going to have to apologize ahead of time for my horrific camera angles. You, you just wouldn't believe the camera setups I've been using. My first video, I used one of those little Bessie clamp things that for circuit boards and that was on top of a bunch of Tupperwares. So I'm doing a little better this time. I've got this little boom army thing, but it's the cheapest money can buy on Amazon, so it's it's not doing very well. Alright, excuses aside, let's pan in a bit. So there's Lady McLeith face, which everyone knows and loves. Uh, my girlfriend is away for two weeks, so you know, brought it home again. Why not? Uh, this is just a, a monitor I had left over from when I had a dual monitor system on my on my PC. I've got this giant 80 volt power supply here from Automation Technologies. I'll put the part number in the description. Uh, it's a beast. It's an unregulated 82 volt toroidal power supply. Uh, you can't really see it, and I don't want to touch it because it's live. But underneath, there's actually one of those uh, 12 volt cheapy power supplies from eBay. Um, and I. I think that's about everything for system components. So I think it would be most useful if I sort of go through the settings I've got. Uh, you press F1, uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen you've got the different windows. F1 brings you to the setup window which has another password, which is also HTG. So you can see here these are the function settings, so you can configure your homing, your spindle, your general settings. Uh, lubrication, tool changer, X, Y, and Z axes, and you can save and load settings as you wish. The side, or sorry, the tab key brings you to the next um, column. So this is your inputs. This is where you can select input four, for example. Press enter, and you can configure what that does. So there's like a cycle start button input. That's kind of cool. Um, automated G code. So I guess that's for if you're doing like six of the same parts over and over. You can use different buttons to just press it and load that G-code. I think that's a pretty neat feature. There's four tool changer inputs, which I'll get to later. They don't do me a whole lot of good. And there's motor alarm inputs, which I will also get to later. Um, pressing tab again, you can configure the outputs. There's uh, spindle clockwise, counterclockwise, uh, tool changer stuff, tower lights, everything there. So, in terms of configuring it, this actually took me a while to figure out. Um, this is how I've set up my homing. So you can see there, there's checkboxes, and that actually sets the sequence for homing. So I've set my Z to home first, and then my X. You can set X, Y, and Z to home at the same time, or any combination therein. And this is also where you set the direction of your homing. So if you hit home and it goes the wrong way, this is where you fix it. You can also set your homing feed rates. <laughs> you have to keep pressing tab to go through these, it's kind of annoying. Uh, I set mine to 500 millimeters per minute. You know, it's slow enough that if I see it's gonna crush my hand or something, I can stop it. Um, and it also lets you set the pull-off distance. So that's, once it touches the sensor, how far in the opposite direction it goes. Um, so this is pretty important, actually. This is the home position. So when it touches the sensors, this is what position is overwritten to the machine position. I've got mine set very specifically to 46.971 because that's the distance tool one is from the center line. I don't think you have to do it that way, but that's the way I did it that makes it work. Um, and I set my z-axis to be a value of one. Uh, we'll get to why that is in a bit. 
Uh, there's also a checkbox for request home on startup. I used to have that checked. It's actually pretty annoying, so I unchecked it. And request home after e-stop is also pretty annoying, so I unchecked it. All right, next is the spindle. So this is where you would put in, if you have a, um, an optical interrupt encoder, this is where you'd put in the number of pulses per rev. Mine's not set up yet, so I just left it at one. And you've also got spindle control method here and the spindle RPM at 100% duty cycle. Now I have actually encountered a problem and uh, tech support has been very friendly and they're working on it, I think. Um, I specified the spindle RPM at 100% duty cycle and then I specified the maximum spindle speed. I think it's uh, G50, I wanna say, uh, in my post processor. The problem I'm having is that the clear path motor I'm using for the spindle actually has a dead band at the end, at the high end of its RPM. So if you send it 100% duty cycle, it stops. It only goes to its maximum speed at 95% duty cycle. And that's actually because if you accidentally plug a positive signal in, they don't want the motor to start. It's, a, it's kind of a safety thing. But unfortunately in this, what it does, when I'm doing constant surface speed, it will actually stop the spindle when I get to the center of the part, which I've noticed is pretty bad for cutting parameters. All right, uh, general settings, millimeters, inches, um, and it looks like there's, you know, an auto-loadable program. Um, disable soft limits, you'll find yourself having to do sometimes. I've set some pretty good soft limits, I think, to stop my machine from crashing into the collet. Um, but I would assume if I changed the collet or if there was another um, tool I was using that was allowed to go past that for some reason, um, I could disable the soft limits here. As it is now, if you start a program that wants to go past the soft limits, it'll tell you before it starts the program, no, it's not gonna work, you can't run this yet. So that is general settings. Lubrication, I haven't done anything on yet, but it looks like it's, um, you specify the amount of time between lubrications and it'll automatically turn on the lubrication pump. That's kind of cool. Uh, I may look into doing that. Um, tool changer. So they've got the manual linear tool changer, which is like gang tooling, and a four station turret. They tried to explain to me in email how this is set up to work. Um, it looks like for the output, you get clockwise or counterclockwise for the tool changer. And I think the tool changer is supposed to send a signal for whatever tool it's on. And uh, that's what the four tool changer inputs are for. They're supposed to receive those different signals. It's, I thought it was sort of weird because you've got four different pins that can be high or low. Um, so therefore you've got two to the four different options. You've got 16 different combinations you can have. So I was thinking it would be cool if they did like a binary thing for that. But then I was thinking that doesn't really help me because I want to control my, I want to control my tool changer with a microcontroller. So what I really need is outputs that do two to the four different combinations. And then my microcontroller can read those pins and say, okay, it's uh, one, zero, zero, one, so I'm going to tool number five or whatever that turns out to be. Um, so maybe they'll implement that, I'm not sure. I've requested it, but um, it looks like my ticket is closed. So we'll see if they get to that or not. Um, X-axis, this is where you configure your X-axis, obviously. So distance per revolution of the motor. I'll put an equation up on the screen for how to calculate that, but basically it's uh, for every revolution of the motor how far the actual axis moves. Pulses per revolution is, uh, it's like number of steps per revolution. Um, for clear path it's 800. You can actually configure that in clear path. If you set it to be too high of a resolution, you'll lose some speed because Maso actually has a 100 kilohertz limit on how fast it can send pulses. I've heard a lot of people complaining about that, but really I can run my machine at full speed. Um, and this resolution gives me, I think, one tenth of linear resolution. So I think that's plenty accurate and goes really fast. So I'm pretty happy with that. I've temporarily set my x-axis to um, 50 millimeters per minute just because I was doing some practicing with a parting tool. I think it's supposed to be a thousand. So I'm gonna set that now. One thing that you'll find is kind of annoying is that you're, you, you're not used to pressing the tab button to go between menus. So you'll press up or down and it seems to call these, these random Unicode characters. 
and like now what do I do? <laughs> you know, it's uh, delete those. It, you know, it's just a little bug. I'm sure they'll fix it, but yeah, it's sort of hey hey, wasted your time. Uh, that's acceleration. This is all in in uh, metric units, but I think that changes if you select inches instead of millimeters. Um, your minimum travel, I set mine to minus one, and your maximum travel, I set mine to plus. 46.971, which is where my limit switch is. Uh, and I also had to invert my direction, although you can do that in clear path MSP as well. Um, this slave to x-axis thing is for if you have um, like a gantry and it has motors, two motors on the x-axis, you can make those only able to move together. Uh, and that's how you do that. Um, so press escape. Um, z-axis obviously is exactly the same as x-axis. It's a little faster for this because it's a five millimeter pitch ball screw. Save and load settings. Uh, if you press that, what you do is it saves a little, um, like a troubleshooting file on your USB stick, and you can then send that to customer support if you need help or something. All right, so that is settings. Uh, inputs and outputs is actually pretty straightforward, so I'm not gonna go through that. Basically, um, it's got the output name here, and that corresponds to a pin on the actual Maso. So if, say you know you plugged a tower light into output 16, um, you can put tower light here on output 16, and you know, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, F2 is where you load your program, and it's also where you do um, your manual user inputs. So that's control shift M. Uh, one thing I've noticed that's kind of annoying is you can leave the MDI open, go to say F3 where you want to jog, and then you go back to F2, and you've got to press Control shift m again to enter MDI again. Uh, it's just another sort of inconvenient little time waster that confuses me more often than not. Uh, if you don't want to enter an MDI command, you can just press Escape, and that makes it go away. So an MDI command example would be S1000M3, and that should turn on the spindle at 1000 RPM. And then M5 stops it. Uh, one thing I would like is a hotkey for starting the spindle. Uh, you wouldn't want to make it just a key because you could accidentally press that. You'd want like Control Shift S or something to do that. But um, for now, I'm okay with just using the MDI. So I'll just press Escape to get out of that. F3 is jog. So you use page up and page down to change the jog step. Uh, they said they were going to change this so you could also do continuous jog. Uh, as it is now, you can only use rapid to um, to continuous jog, but like I said, they're going to change it. Um, F4, this is the tool table. I'm having a bit of a hard time with this. Um, so I've got two tools in my turret right now. I've set one to be the master tool. Um, I don't know if you have to do that or not, but I did. And then I've got, these are the two tools. So I pressed enter on one of those, and this is what it gives you. It gives you tool name, a Z offset. So this thing for test piece diameter, basically you're going to put a piece of stock in your spindle and you're going to take a light cut out of it using jog. Um, then you're going to measure that without moving the x-axis, input what your measurement is, and then hit touch. And then it should remember the difference between the tip of the tool and the machine coordinate in the x-axis. I'm having a bit of a tough time with this right now because it doesn't seem to work like I would expect it to. There's an option here in Jog for touching off on the part. You're going to do Control Z to touch off on Z. See, it set Z to zero. And then this is something that really confuses me. There's an option for touching off on X, and I don't know why. I think on a regular CNC lathe, you would go up and touch the outside of the part and punch in what the radius was, and that, I mean, that's basically how you set your offset. I think the implication here is that you jog your tool to the center line and press Control X, and then it doesn't zero it, it sets it to something random. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. It has been giving me issues with um, cutting the wrong radius. So I'm sort of keen to hear if I'm doing something wrong on that. So F5 corresponds to wizards. This is the description. You can name it like face or something. I'm not sure why it did the small caps there. There we go. Face, uh, the date, um, don't care. Output G code file name is face face face. There we go. And A to add, I can do face. And then I mean I'm not gonna go through this whole thing, but basically you can say face. 
There's something funny with the Masso about how long the key is depressed versus how many characters it puts on the screen. So you'll see me double type a lot of stuff, and that's why. Uh, tool number one, roughing RPM, 2000, finishing RPM, 3000. This all should be continuous surface speed, but it isn't. Roughing speed, finishing speed, uh, yeah, you get the idea. So I'll just press escape to get out of that. Um, when you're done with it, you hit control P to post and it shows up basically on your USB stick. Uh, speaking of which, F6 is where you load the files. So it shows the files down here. You're just going to press enter loads up the file. These are all from Fusion 360. The post processor that they suggest for Fusion 360 doesn't actually work. They suggest using the FANUC one. Just off the top of my head, one issue is that um, FANUC post tools, like say it was tool 2, it would be T0202, and that would correspond to tool number 2 with offset number 2. Uh, Masso doesn't like that, it says invalid tool number, so I went in and changed the post. I'll put my post up on my Patreon for free. Uh, just to it incorporate some of my changes. Uh, another thing is if you're doing tangent arcs, so pistol bullet for example, you see that uh, that really ugly cut right there? That's actually a problem with the tangent arcs. It doesn't like i, j, and k arguments, so I had to change it to put uh, r arguments. Um, so the default fanic does this, uh, and then I had to fix it. So well, didn't fix it there. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out. So yeah, with R arguments, it doesn't do that. And that's, I've only had a problem with it with two tangent arcs, but it's a pretty serious problem. Um, okay, so that is basically Masso in a nutshell. It's quite straightforward. Uh, the keyboard interface isn't great. Like I said, that thing with double pressing keys is kind of annoying and also it accidentally pressing up or down makes it display gobbledygook. That's kind of annoying. Other than that, though, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. The the preview is accurate, it looks like. So The other thing I should mention is that the Masso documentation is actually quite good. Um, if you have any questions, you can go on their documentation and they usually have answers for you. And their customer service is also very good. They usually get back to you within sort of a day or two. Um, and they're quite helpful, quite receptive. Um, I'm sure I've bugged them enough, and <laughs> I'm giving them a little break now before I go in for round two. But uh, yeah, they're they've been they've been really good. So, anyways, that's uh, that's the Masso setup, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share it with your friends. Uh, I have a Patreon, which I've plugged enough in this video. So, if you feel like going there and downloading my my free Masso setup stuff and and my diagrams, you know, maybe throw throw a few dollars in the hat, and that'll that'll help out with getting some better camera equipment. That's that's for sure. Um, and I also have an Instagram, which is also hlaps1990. If you want to follow along on the day to day and all the little machining jobs I do. Uh, until the next video, cheers.